this episode I, I have it in my mind that I just want to simplify real estate for even people who are just joining the industry and so I have to find some way of telling it to you I can't tell you I'm anxious or nervous if you're selling millions you gotta look like a million dollar broker hey everyone new episode of take charge this is the first episode of 2023 Welcome back, doctor. Hope you had an amazing uh, holidays. Nice break at the end of the year, but all charged up. The year has begun. Let's make our money. Amazing. Doctor, tell us, first of all, uh, most of the brokers are telling us like, you know, we want to put our goals. We want to put our objective. What are we looking at? Uh, but we don't know how to do it. What do you say to that? <laughs> okay. Uh... Do you, want the, do you want the happy answer or do you want the... I want the actual answer because okay. for me, I mean, like your goals is something that you really want. You want to feel it. If you say, I want a nice car, you want to envision yourself driving a car. Like sometimes I pass next to brokers on their desk and I see someone putting a chest and eight abs and he's like 40 kgs overweight. I'm like, if you want to achieve this, you need a training program, you need a food plan and you need specific character. You need to cut off alcohol, but... You cannot just put the picture and this body will just jump in here. Right, absolutely. Okay, let's answer this question in, in two ways, okay? Uh, the first thing is, uh, I liken goal setting to using a GPS. Now, the GPS is ex essentially a directional device. It's a, it's a tracking device in a way. So let's say I want to go from here to Abu Dhabi and I decide Abu Dhabi is my goal. The GPS is going to choose for me the best possible route. I can even select the route, toll-free roads, etc. It's going to tell me 128 minutes and you're going to be in Abu Dhabi. Now, the purpose of the GPS is if I follow the instructions, the GPS is going to constantly give me feedback on my progress and I'm able to see, okay, another 60 minutes I'm going to reach. It gives me my pace and speed at which I'm going. Can I, do I need to slow down? Do I need to quicken my pace? All of that can be done. But for that, I need to work uh, in line with what the GPS is instructing me. Goal setting is a lot like working with GPS. The GPS in goal setting stands for your goals, your priorities, and your strategies. So the goal is what is it that you want to achieve, which you will have to define for yourself. We cannot define it for you. Now, once you have identified what you want to achieve, you need to then create priorities. What are the things that must be done so I can achieve that goal? Probably I'll give an example on this later. So I need to create my priorities. I might have three or four priorities so that I can hit that goal. Mm. Now, to ensure that these priorities actually happen, I need to have strategies. That's the S. So for each of these priorities, what are three things that you're going to do this year to ensure that you will be able to meet that priority? Because if I can meet those priorities, then I will hit my goal. So let's take an example. If one of my goals is to increase the number of listings by 20 listings every single month. So that may be one goal that I'm creating. So I will create a priority under that. Develop an active network of engaging and communicating with sellers in a particular community. That might be a priority for me. So what are the three strategies I'm going to now put in place so that I can develop an active and engaged network with sellers in the community? That's how I make my strategies. So a GPS takes the large goal, prioritizes what must be done to achieve the goal, and then creates strategies for each of these goals. Break it down as daily task. Absolutely. Come down to exactly what you need to do. Now, I use an approach which is called the 5R approach. I thought it's one of the most powerful ways to set up goals. So it's a 5R approach. The first R is the results. What is it that you want to achieve? Which we need to define in a very specific way with the clear numbers that can be measured and managed. So the, that's my results. The second R is the reasons. Why is it important for you to achieve that? You see, a lot of people set goals but they don't know why that is really important. I want to have a million dirhams by the end of 2023. Well, why do you need a million dirhams by the end of 2023? What's going to change in your life as a result of that money? Sales is not a career, it's a lifestyle. Okay, so why do you need that money? 
so if for my goals to uh, convert into passion and meaning the reasons need to be articulated when i can explain why i want to achieve that goal it brings focus it brings discipline it brings a commitment and anything that happens around me doesn't distract me what happens if the market slows down because i know why that goal is important for me i will put the effort into it i will discipline myself and i'll be persistent about it so let's put it as an image i want to have a 1 million dirhams end of the year because i want to buy my parents a house absolutely so why is this important because my parents have been living for the last 40 years in a rented house i want to give my parents a house of their own now that brings the passion into what you have to do the commitment the discipline when you hear the 50 100 200 no's what's going to wake you up I want to give my mom and dad that house. And this is what will keep you boosted. This is what will keep you going. And trust me, when you buy your parents a house, that feeling of self-fulfillment, there is nothing can beat it. It's like you made one billion dollars. Yeah. And you know what's the best thing? Once you hit that, your second one is easier. You're, you're going to go for it like as a tiger. So uh, the results or the goal without the reason is going to lack the uh, credibility. It's going to lack the effort to make it happen. The third R is the resources. Now that I know what I want, I know even why I need to get it. Now, what are the resources I need? Who should I be talking to? What new skills should I pick up? Which club should I become a member of? Who should I be connecting with? What should I be watching? Which books I should be? What are the resources that I need so that I can achieve the goal? That's your third R. This is the difference between how goals people set goals. You see, goal setting is easy. Goal getting is the important thing. So we have, to break, we have to break it down. So once I know the resources, then the fourth R is my reviews. How am I going to monitor my, process, my progress during the year? How am I going to map? Am I on track, off track? What does the GPS system do? It's constantly giving you feedback. You are 37 minutes away. 10 minutes ahead is going to be right. It's constantly giving you feedback on your performance on the journey till that point. Your goal setting mechanism should also have a review system built into it. I can't wait till the end of the first quarter to figure out I'm off track. I can't wait till the end of the year. I should have a continuous review system built so I know how I can align and come back on track. And the fifth R is the rewards. Now, I call these the milestone motivators. It's not enough to just have that grand prize at the end, which is the goal that I achieve. You need to motivate yourself along the way. So set milestones. By the time, if once I achieve priority number one, I'm gonna buy myself this amazing little watch. So set those kind of motivators and rewards. The satisfaction that comes in when you achieve is, is great. And it even makes you more excited about the next quarter because there is something that you want that you're put at the end of the quarter as a little reward or a gift to yourself. And this is not like what, what you're preaching. This is what you're doing. I saw that you bought your watch. Like, I was actually going to give that as yeah. an example. Uh, I've always loved the Graham watches. I've got a lot of my wa yeah. watches, but I wanted the Graham. Now, did I have to wait till the end of the year to get the Graham? The answer is no, I could have bought the Graham. But buying a Graham, just by paying money for it, isn't as exciting. I was actually in Bangkok, but when I had hit my goals for the year, I was sitting in Bangkok, I'm on holiday, and I was searching for this particular Graham model. And when I saw it on the internet, available in Dubai, I WhatsApp them from Bangkok. And when they responded, yet it's available, we have one piece, I said, book it for me right now. I'm sitting in Bangkok, but I'm booking a watch that I could have bought any time through the year. Mm -hmm. I came back at three o'clock in the morning. By three o'clock that afternoon, the watch was in my hand. Sleep didn't matter. And now, it felt Here's the difference. Amazing. This time when you took the watch, there's an excitement that goes through you. That is why I posted and said, my year end gift to myself. So I think these motivators are very important. It gives you a sense of achievement. It brings you out stronger into the next quarters and you are able to ace your goals because there's a rewarding feeling. Not only am I giving mom and dad that home that we talked about, I'm taking care of myself in the process. So to summarize this, a good goal setting program will have five hours. The results, what is it that you want to achieve? The reasons, why is this important for you? The resources, what do you need? Who do you need to help you to get these? The reviews, how are, how are you going to measure and stay on track? and the rewards. How are you going to look after yourself in the process during the journey?
If we can take care of all of these, then you're on track to hit your goals. The five R's, do you hear the sound? The <laughs> sound of viewers taking notes. Yeah, absolutely. I want to add on what you said. Uh, I do something, I've been practicing it from day one, and it's called self-assessment. So basically what I do, I do it on a daily basis, I do it on a weekly basis, I do it on a monthly, quarterly, and yearly. How it goes, every night before I go to bed, I just pick up my phone, and I do a video for a minute or for two minutes talk about how was my day. Did I give it my all today or, or could I have given it more? And then I say tomorrow I'm gonna do one, two, three, four, close. Second day I do the video. If I do only one, two, I haven't done the three and four, I'm gonna feel guilty. Then I'm say, okay, you didn't do all of your best today. Give it for the day after it. And this is what keeps me going. I, by the end of the week, I also sit and do my self-assessment. Was it my best week? Could I have done more in this? And this is what I do through all of the year. Daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and yearly. And this goes back to your GPS strategy, which will put you right on track. No one will know how to assess you except yourself. And if I could add to that, there's two things I want to say here. One is activity that is measured is activity that gets managed. Quality that is controlled is quality that is assured. And I'll leave one more tip for those who are listening to this. You set your goals for the year, but those goals cannot be achieved in 12 months. You have to achieve them in 10 months. Let me tell you why. Typically, you will have 52 Sundays. You lost 50 days of the year already. There's not much you're going to be doing on those days typically. Now, you will take a few breaks. There'll be a few holidays in between. So you only have 10 months to hit your 12-month target. So people who make their plan thinking they got 12 months are going to fall short at the end. So you got to make your annual target, but you got to aim to achieve it in 10 months. Now there's two benefits to this. If I wait till the end of the year, and if I'm 10% short, 15% short, I have no time to recover and catch up. I'm going into the next year. But if I, aim, if I aim to do it in 10 months, I get a bit more aggressive in how I achieve it, more creative. Even if I hit 80 to 90% in 10 months, I've got another 30 days to be on track. So the most effective way to do this would be to plan achieving that 12 month target in 10 months. That gives you the additional time to be able to catch up or to over exceed your goals. Doctor, this episode, I, I have it in my mind. That I just want to simplify real estate for even people who are just joining the industry. Why I'm wearing like that? Why you're wearing like that? Tell us what's the importance of the appearances and the suits. Okay. Uh, people judge within the first three to five seconds everything about you, about the opportunity that you present, your own legacy, and your success at what you do. And especially in an industry like real estate, the clients that you're going to be working with are usually achievers. They're at the top of their field. They're millionaires, centi-millionaires, and the billionaires. They understand quality. They, when they look at you, the first impression is they got to see a person who's comfortable with luxury, with an expensive mindset, who can relate and associate with products that are $10 million, $20 million. Now, that doesn't mean you cannot turn up in Bermuda shorts and be comfortable with that. As a client, that's fine. We have to present ourselves, excuse me, if the brand that we are presenting is premium, if the opportunity we are uh, presenting is premium, then as ambassadors, we cannot be anything short of premium. It is not acceptable for people who don't have the right personal hygiene, personal grooming, careful selection, choice of colors and combinations that they wear, subtle perfumes, uh, fragrances, loud, strong colors, heavy jewelry are all distractors to the process. People are forming impressions about you by looking at these things. And what's even more important is all through the selling process, while they may be listening to you, while they may be understanding what you're presenting, your presence is an unconscious statement throughout that process. Would you go into a premium showroom to buy a high-end car if you saw somebody in an Adidas t-shirt and probably ripped jeans? I mean. The person is at a disconnect with the product that he's trying to sell. The client immediately feels odd about someone like that. So it's very important that we dress 
to represent the industry that we are part of. And we are selling a product that comes in the top 1% or 2% of products worldwide. You have to be seen as top 1% to 2% in the world. People buy from people they like, but people like people like themselves. So uh, when you meet someone, it's not like your personality that will show in the first seconds. It's like your appearance that's going to speak on your behalf. So you want to make sure, as the doctor said, if you're selling millions, you got to look like a million dollar broker. And this will get you in the flow of people start listening to you. When can we call someone a specialist? Okay. When you call someone a specialist, there are several things that come to mind here uh, that people make an evaluation on. A specialist is generally seen as someone who's got a very solid understanding of that community that he's presenting. So he's got to understand the big picture going backwards itself. For example, who was the developer who even conceptualized the idea in the first place? What was the thinking of that developer? And how is this lifestyle going to contribute to the brand of Dubai itself? How does it enhance the value of the people who are going to be living in the community? So we need to firstly understand the concept of the community. Why this community makes a difference or a contribution to the bigger picture. Then they need to be able to understand everything within the community that makes it what it is. So you have to know every little thing uh, like the nearest grocery store, the salons that you have, the pet clinics, uh, the clubs for the kids, the, uh, the parks in the area, any new thing that opens up, you have to be fully aware about it. When you go into, you should be in a position where, let's say you're calling a seller and the seller says, my apartment is apartment 1502. You should be able to on the phone itself say, okay, I understand. This is the apartment at the left side with the two side view of the Palm Jumeirah, is that correct? That's when people begin to say, okay, this he has got his finger on the pulse of the community. He understands literally anything and everything. You also are considered an expert if you're able to comment on who are the type of people who live in that community? What kind of families, what kind of lifestyle opportunities are within that community? So who would be looking to move into that community? What, who your neighbors would be in that kind of community? Anything that can talk about the DNA of the community is very important. Over and above all this information, it is very important for me to understand the uh, social activities, everything. Uh, do people like noise? Is this a community which is noisy? Is it vibrant? Is it silent? Is it for families and secluded lifestyles? The whole personality of the community needs to be understood. The confidence of the person when they speak about it will also show when they are an expert. Look at experts in any industry. When they speak, the conviction and the confidence with which they speak makes people want to listen to them because you know that he knows what he's talking about. Also, to be seen as an expert, you need to have a track record, a legacy in that community. You might be extremely well presented. You are very, very uh, influential in how you communicate. You understand selling, but people need to be able to see that you are uh, you've got a legacy. How many units, for example, have you actually sold in that community? How many listings do you have in that community? I wanted to come to this. What's the acceptable number of listings to be considered as a specialist? Okay, if you have and to... very well priced listing, not just to list for the... <laughs> okay, if you are going to have above 30 listings, for example, in a community, and that's when you could be looked at as a person who, even if you're not considered an expert, you're definitely well-versed relevant in the community and what's even better is if the 30 plus units that you have are not in a single tower if they are in different because you can have sub communities if it's in a single tower it could always be that you manage to have a connect with one person who could be a bulk owner and he has listed his 30 units with you mm -hmm. that doesn't make you an expert you're seen as an expert when i've got a few units in different towers and I've got uh, villas in the community, I have the townhouses, I've got the sea views, I have all of that listed because that is a statement where the community is talking about me. The community is telling people that we trust him and that's why our units are with him. Regardless of whether it's a townhouse, an apartment or a villa, we want to list with him. So the community makes a statement on your behalf. That's when people have the credibility of knowing that you've got legacy. You also, of course, need to have sales. 
to your name. Just getting the listings out there and not showing a legacy in terms of how you have helped the homeowners in that community sell or buyers to come into that community, that's equally important. That's the credibility that you have to show. And also getting this volume of listings, I say always 35 and above, uh, that landlords will start calling you and telling you, I have a similar unit and I have this price in mind. Can you flip it for me or can you rent it for me? Or what's your thought about this? Okay, again, yes. If you are seen as an expert, then people actually believe and they would be also reaching out to you. And they could do this for two reasons. One, they might have been curious. If I'm a landlord, I would probably go onto a listing portal and I would try and find brokers who have got larger number of listings in there which is the credibility statement the community is giving then those are the people i would want to get in touch with it's also possible that they got to me because of a referral that was given which is also good because the referrals have said this is the guy that you should be listing with so that's when they would come to me if you are an expert they are also willing to have the price discussion with you, the opportunity window, the acceptable timelines, because when I see you as an expert in that area, I am willing to have the, a quality conversation, I even consider what you are telling me is going to be the best price or the most opportune window within which we can sell this property for you. Doctor, how frequent should a specialized agent be looking at the transactions happening in the area, whether from the uh, rent and the sales. Okay, uh, now ideally you're talking of, uh, I would say three transactions a week. Okay. Three transactions a week is something that they should be hitting. Now, you can have a specialist. No, sorry, what I'm asking you about is like, you know that there is a lots of applications and uh, portals and stuff that tells you the daily sales happening. So I'm telling you, being a specialized agent in a specific area, how frequently you should be looking at the latest sales done by others? I think you should be looking at it every day. Every day, as like a... Absolutely. Okay. When, uh, in fact, what I usually tell people in my trainings, when you wake up in the morning, the first thing that you do, even before you brush your teeth, the first thing you will do is you will get onto the land department website, you will see how your community has performed. You need to know how the city performed on the previous day. You also need to know how your community performed. You can get into a property monitor. You can get into other portals. There are many good ones that give us information. And you need to know how your area performed the previous day. Because trends are built by looking and reading at everyday performances. You should know your numbers on a daily basis. There have been times I walked into brokerages and I tell them, well, how many, how many transactions were registered in Dubai yesterday? And they'll tell me uh, we had uh, 3.4 billion. I said, no, that's not right. And I said, no, it is showing. I said, no, you're looking only at sale. Where's the mortgage transactions? So you should be in that position where when you walk in immediately. No, what's cash? What's classic finance? example. We are now into the, uh, the, the 4th of January. I doubt many brokers can right now tell you how many transactions were registered in the whole of last year in Dubai. What was the cash to mortgage it, ratio? It was up year. all of this information. Yeah, it's all up. 2022 was the strongest yeah, ever in the history of but they the don't. They, that's what they don't look at. They should be able to tell you 401 billion dirhams, 117,000 transactions. That's an average of 9,700 transactions a month with an average revenue of 33 billion. Cash to mortgage ratios were 83 to 17%, 83% cash. If you look in comparison with the previous year, there's been a 62% jump in the cash transactions and only a 2% jump in the mortgage transactions. And we know the reason for that why. And when we see this amount of cash buyers, this is a massive indicator that all of our investors are experts. There are people coming from Europe, they are moving their money in here. And this is like a clear indication for everyone who's saying that Dubai has reached its peak and now it's gonna go to a reversal, this reversal is not happening. If people are going through mortgages, you will know that they are just a simple employees trying to buy a house. But once you have 83% of cash buyers, this is a massive indication that the trend is gonna keep going all the way up. You know, the end of December 2021, people said the same thing. The expo has come, it's half over, prices are gonna drop now. And we've seen, we saw what happened. We had a massive, if you look at last year, 
the volume of transactions was 47% more than 2021. Value went up 45%. So the people who said the same thing last year are going to say the same thing now that we have reached this. But we know the predictions. Realist has already uh, shown us an expectation of 46% increase this year alone with a 13.5% increase in price. Yeah. Which is why I always say there's going to be two types of buyers in the Dubai market. Incredible winners or incredible losers. Now, we don't have to convince you to come into Dubai. 160 nationalities are telling you you should be in Dubai. If 117,000 millionaires have invested 400 billion last year, we don't have to tell you that you have to invest in Dubai. The world is telling you you should be in Dubai. You know what they say, scared money, make no money. So. <laughs> Absolutely. People are using this now as an objection, saying we have hit the peak, it's gonna go down, and agents are really getting angry listening to this, not knowing how to handle this objection, and uh, which will immediately will lead the agent to say that this lead is a bad lead, and they put them as a dead lead and goes to the pool that no one will even call again. So I just want to understand from your side, why do even people object from, first of all, is it a lack of money? Is it lack of intent? What, what does people make them like object? All right, okay. Now, I think what's really important for us, to, before we even look at uh, the reason why they are objecting is, as a professional salesperson, I should have the ability to recognize, am I dealing with a genuine objection? Or is this just some form of resistance? Because if it is just some form of resistance, it's pointless in even answering that because there is no deal coming at the end of it. I need to be able to expose that and go to what is the real reason. So I, I use the word resistance here yeah, more than an objection because there's four different ways in which the objection can be raised. It could be raised as an excuse. So for example, Dubai is a bubble. Could be one. So or, bubble from 2014. or there's a recession coming. Yeah. Or interest rates are going up. Now, all of these on the surface look like objections. But maybe he's just giving it as an excuse. So if it's only an excuse, there's no point in addressing that because he's not buying as a result of an answer to that. Or it might be perception. Something he heard, something he's just cooked up, or something he has created as an opinion because he's been listening to this over the years from people. That's just a perception. It's not even founded on fact. Then it could be a genuine concern, which is an objection, and that's a good one. Because if they have a genuine concern, it means they are giving me the opportunity to answer and address that concern. They're saying that we are interested, but we are worried about one, two, three. One, two, three. What do you have to say for that? Essentially what they're yeah. saying is, if you can help answer these questions for me, clear away the clouds, give me the straight answers to this, I'm willing to consider making a decision on this. So they're giving you the opportunity to change how they think about it, seal the deal, and start to build the relationship. Objections are a sign of interest. I'm actually listening to you and I'm processing and evaluating what you're saying. It may just not be matching what I've heard somewhere, so I want to voice my concern to give you the opportunity to clarify. That's good. That's what we call an objection. Now the fourth manner in which the resistance can be thrown at us is, is actually a counter, a negotiation counter. Uh, now is not a good time to buy. Uh, prices have gone very high. The bubble is coming. Markets are delayed in Dubai. All of those things will come. They might be using it simply as a negotiation tactic to see what you're going to throw back as a softer payment plan or a waiver on service fees for three years. So at the end of the day, they're trying to take some value from it. So you never answer an objection without first qualifying which one of these four is actually being raised. Now, to come to the actual question, which was, what is the reason when, why do these people actually raise these objections? You see, the first reason is this. It's just natural unconscious pattern. All of us as humans, our brains are wired to protect us. So they look for our benefit. And in any sales transaction, they will look to get the most for us. Why do you think the word free has been used so effectively around the world? Because people want to believe they're getting something for nothing. So our brain unconsciously can resist because we have met salespeople in the past who made promises to us, but the product did not perform the same way. Now it's not you, I haven't dealt with you before, but I've dealt with salespeople before. So I have a history of, 
of a recollection of what has happened and that history is creating within me a feeling of nervousness and anxiety and so I have to find some way of telling it to you. I can't tell you I'm anxious or nervous. So I'll find an excuse or I'll make an objection about something. So once we begin to understand this as salespeople, we become empathetic. Our body language remains open. We are understanding and we accommodate the client because we understand what he's actually telling us. Hey, I'm feeling a little bit nervous about this. I've had a few bad experiences before. So that could be one reason why they object. The second reason is lack of trust and rapport. Salespeople aren't the best in creating that rapport and building the relationship. They kind of like try to tend to close the deal over the phone without a meeting, yeah, without absolutely. anything, thinking that someone is willing to drop uh, his 10%, yeah. 100, 200,000 dirhams just See, that, that's essentially because they don't respect the client, they don't respect his money, they don't even respect the nobility of the profession that they have. They only care about closing the deal. So or, it's very, or doctor, maybe they don't know what they're doing. Transaction. Possible as well. Uh, I'm willing, I'm hoping that they do know what they're doing, but again, the genuinely, genuinely very few salespeople are actually interested in their clients and in the money the client is putting. So this is what the client's are. interest. And the client's interest, yeah. yeah. So as a result of this, they don't build the rapport and they don't build the trust. Now remember, we've had bad experiences in the past with salespeople. That's my unconscious pattern that's coming into the conversation. And now I see you not willing to spend time to get to know me and build trust and make me feel comfortable. That historical recollection, you are shaping up exactly like one of those past people in my mind. And that's one reason why I'm resisting and raising the objections. Third reason, very, very important reason. We call this the immediacy effect. The immediacy effect is the tendency of people to look at what is in front of them right now. We all understand ROI, which is return on investment. There is another term to consider, which is POI, the price of the investment. If they cannot see the fit of the product to their need. If my salesperson hasn't qualified correctly, taken the time to understand, he he started qualifying, well, I'm looking for a four bedroom villa. Just last week he attended a, a presentation and okay, farm villas are coming up. So immediately he jumps to presenting farm. Finish the qualifying. So just because I started the qualifying and I can already link some product to it, I get into solution presenting. Like if the guy wants to be in the springs, the farm villa is not his product. <laughs> and vice versa, if yeah. someone is working towards that, that area. And then you bring him here. Bring him to yeah. Shamsayad Road, it's not going to work with that. So I have not taken the time to qualify. So the product doesn't fit the need. Of course I'm going to object to it. You think I'm going to sit and say this is fantastic? Now, the challenge with the POI is, especially in off-plan selling, this is the price of the investment is now, it's in my face. You're asking me to put 10 million, a 20%, that means I have to put 2 million now. This unit will be delivered to me three years in the future, maybe even five years in the future. So I cannot see the value or the return because it's in the future. What I can see now is the 2 million that you're asking me to present. 2, two million lighter, becoming 2 million and lighter. <laughs> that is the immediacy effect. Now let's combine all of this. I have past negative experiences with salespeople. You haven't taken the time to build your rapport with me. You have not presented a product that matches exactly what I'm looking for. And now I have to pay for something where the value is coming four to five years later. And I cannot trust you. Flex, 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 flex. And Leave me alone. That is another reason. That is why when we understand why people are objecting, it helps us become more empathetic and understanding. Our body language remains open. We include them in the conversation. And I'll give you one more reason which I think really matters here. It's called the sense of purchasing power or freedom. A loss of purchasing power or freedom. Let's say I have 20 million in my bank account, right? Now, that's a lot of money. And I can do 50,000 things that I want, anything I want without having to worry about where the money is going to come from or how am I going to get it. Because I have the money. I may not do any of those 50,000 things, but just the fact that I can do it without worrying where the money comes from is a sense of purchasing power. It's a sense of freedom. Everybody likes that. But now I'm considering a 6.8 million villa. Now when I put the 6.8 million into that, I don't have the same freedom with my remaining money to do whatever I want. Now I'm going to have to think about my second big purchase. 
that feeling people don't like. It's like a loss of purchasing power or freedom. So I cannot express it to you, but I'm feeling a certain anxiety because of that. And that is causing me to raise a concern. Plus, I have historical influence. You haven't built rapport with me. You haven't fit it to my need. And this sense of purchasing power being taken away from me is all coming together. Is it any wonder that people start to raise concerns and objections? Good professional salespeople understand this. That's why they don't rush the rapport building process. They build the trust. They engage on the relationship first. They sell the relationship. Then they go through the qualifying. They fully understand the qualifying with even a sweeping question. After they've understood everything and summarized with the client, answer me from what you told me, one, two, three, four, five. Is that correct? Well, yes. Is there anything else I should know, Anthony? They throw the sweeping question so that I get everything from you before I'll attempt to fit the solution to the need. So if all of these are being done, the objections which will come out will be genuine ones, not the excuses, not the perceptions, and they would be even willing to listen to the answers when I give it to them. So these are really the reasons why people object. What we know typically historically is the no money, no time, no need, no trust, all fit within this lot. That is how they express it. But we need to understand what's really going on in the mind of the client, which is these resistances. Let's break down into three or four categories. How to handle a cold lead means someone who inquired earlier, but it was not the right time for, for them. How to handle a hot lead that came, let's say, online inquiry, Instagram, Facebook, Google, whatever it is. How to handle a lead that is, you know that this person has the money, but as you were saying, he has been terribly served before and has no interest, which is like most probably he's going to be the person who brushes off, send me email, send me what's up, I'm busy. So how to break it down into all of this, how to handle each one by one? Okay, I think to get the detailed answers for these, they should be signing up on the courses with us. Absolutely, but yeah. let us just give, we'll them, give them some bits. And so. Let's look at the three personalities we talked about, three pers lead personalities here. The first one is a cold lead, where at one point they gave us their information because they had some interest. You need to be able to reference that when you contact the person. Because the first question in people's mind is always, where did you get my number from? Okay, there is a certain irritation that can come into the call as well. And in some cases, they might even want to raise a complaint against you, or at least they use that to push you off. So when you reference the fact that you had sent in an inquiry a few months ago with regards to this, I've already answered the question as to where I got your information from. It also in some way rationalizes why I'm contacting you again. Now, six months ago when you had contacted us, you were very interested in this kind of a property. The reason I'm calling you today is something very similar just got announced in Dubai. And that's the reason why I'm calling to speak to you. So you need to reference point it and then come into the conversation. However, at this point in the conversation, it's more about the attitude that's speaking behind the conversation is uh, just calling to get to see whether this would be something you might be interested in now, because this was the kind of opportunity that you had been looking in before. And if this is something you could be interested in, we can discuss next steps going forward on that. How do you feel about that? So this is how I would go in with them, because at this point, property is not on their mind. So I cannot directly go in and say, ask for a meeting. I need to create interest. I build the interest into serious interest. That's when I can offer the meeting. Like for example, uh, I got an allocation from this developer for this six townhouses, which is a pre-launch and we are taking expression of interest right now. How about we meet so I can explain it to you, show it to you on the master plan and see what's the benefit of being in this property. Definitely. You just made him a little bit interested or curious to know why the six units that they are super special, this exclusivity. Like I feel once we are selling a product and if the client feels that all of this inventory is accessible for everyone, it doesn't really hype it's it up and exclusive. no one is interested in it. But once they feel like this is something super special, 
they always are curious just to find out more and they will do this extra effort. Yeah. Which is also the reason why you reference back to their first inquiry because they had at that time inquired for something that might have been boutique or just that one community that mm. got launched. And because of that, since there is limited offering now and this is generating a lot of excitement among investors like you, we are getting in touch with you. Like you lost the opportunity once, don't lose it again. Perfect. How Let's to handle these guys okay. who keeps like... Uh, yeah, 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 true, I inquired, but listen, I'm too busy right now, send me a WhatsApp, we'll talk later, hang up. Okay, now, if they say send me a WhatsApp and we'll talk later and they hang up, they haven't given you an opportunity to speak to them. I don't Would send you a WhatsApp. Would you say? Great, I wouldn't too. I wouldn't because... When he says send me a WhatsApp and he doesn't hang up. Okay, now... How do you keep him like... Okay, here's what you got to do, okay. You have to first see at which point is he saying, send me a WhatsApp. Is it, if it's at the beginning of the call, what he's essentially telling you is, I don't want to talk to you. Mm. If it is at the end of the call, I've gone through the call, but now he's saying, I don't want to meet. Yeah. So send me a WhatsApp. They're two different situations. So what's my intent in the beginning when he says, send me a WhatsApp. I don't want to send him a WhatsApp, but I'll change the tone of my uh, call just to keep him on the phone. So I would turn around and say, that's exactly what I'm planning to do. I said, but I only want to send you what's important rather than sending you this big document. But to do that, Anthony, I just needed some information. That's why I called you. So I'm changing the tone to say like, hey, I was actually planning to contact you by WhatsApp, but I didn't want to send everything. I just wanted to find out first what would be of interest. That's the reason I'm calling you and then the WhatsApp will come. So would you be okay if I asked you a couple of questions and then send it out? Now, what's the intent here? If he says, well, yeah, okay, make it quick. They will tend to tell you, okay, make it quick because they feel they're answering questions or so WhatsApp will come, not the meeting request. So they'll be open to giving you the permission. In the process of asking the questions, I can grow the interest. And we are now suddenly, we're talking, we are asking questions. It's going a little back and forth. I can even ask feeler questions like say, so Anthony, what do you think about what, how do you feel about what I just said? So I can go into a conversation and I could get an opportunity to offer a meeting even there once again. But he said, send me a WhatsApp to stop talking to me. I respond differently. So he is talking to me and in the talking, I can bring him to a point because if he has got a curiosity, he's not going to say yes to a meeting. Curiosity always ends up with send me a WhatsApp because the need is not there for me to come. I have to convert the curiosity to serious interest. When serious interest enters the conversation, that's when a person is willing to consider two hours in the desert coming to meet you or agreeing to come onto a Zoom meeting if they are international uh, clients. So I don't take curiosity to closure. That's the resistance. That's where they'll say, I'll call you back or I'm busy right now. I take curiosity to serious intent. I think international investors are easier. Someone tells me, send me a WhatsApp. I'm going to tell him there's nothing to see in the WhatsApp except writing. I need to have a Zoom with you to explain to you this floor plans and the layouts, which the ones that I see are super beneficial, where you can really make your capital gains. And in case you want to use them, you're going to be having the best views. Yeah. See, there is no, they already know that they don't have the commitment to agree to a meeting right now and to get into a car and come. So yes, it does become easier as well. But even with that, what you want to do is create intent. You want them to look for, otherwise what usually happens is they'll agree to a Zoom and then later they'll say, I'm busy right now, I can't come, they'll cancel. So to minimize the cancellations, you need to create the serious intent. And giving the value for yourself that you are not an order taker. Absolutely. You are here as a specialist who are showing them what's happening from this developer. It's not just like send me email, send me WhatsApp, send me this, book me this unit. Anyone can do that. Your real value is by your knowledge, by you knowing this history of the area, why this building is extremely beneficial for everyone. Yeah. You can use another approach in this case. If they're telling you send me a WhatsApp, send me an email, you could always say definitely, absolutely, certainly. But from our experience, brochures, emails and WhatsApps will give you barely 15 to 20 percent information about the community and how you will make your money and returns in the community. The people who actually invested in this community visited us 
at the sales centers where they saw the master plan. And Once they saw the master plan, they understood why this community will generate that kind of returns or give them that kind of lifestyle. And they always ended up buying. That's the reason why I'm offering a meeting so you can understand the community ask all the relevant questions before you even decide whether you want to go into it you can not. always use the reverse psychology by saying i send it to lots of people who never understood the value and by the time that they came to the sales center and loved yeah, it it was too late the project was already sold out so i'm not gonna forgive myself doing the same mistake that i have done earlier that's why i want to meet you absolutely it works right so, so this is the idea guys like today you need to start loving respecting yourself and truly valuing yourself in order for you to value a person and value his investment doctor was the year starting and we have uh, a crazy projections coming to dubai you just said 13.5 and my own estimation is gonna go way higher with everything happening in the world outside of Dubai, like the great uh, layoffs happening in the States, the, the great, uh, I don't know, also layoffs happening in Europe and everyone worried about that side of the world. We in Dubai, how are we facilitating everyone to come move here, starting a new life from company formations, from schools, from communities, like tell us, if you are talking to a friend who lives in Europe or the States, how would you tell him about Dubai? Okay, I think the first, uh, there, are, there are several statistics and performance indicators in the market that, uh, that can uh, answer this. The first thing is we know that the highest number of millionaires migrating to any country in the world is the UAE. Now these are people who have done all their due diligence, they've anticipated every scenario, what happens in a, in a crisis, it could be an economic crisis, it could be a natural crisis, it could be a health pandemic. They've looked at all of these because they've experienced that in the past and they have even carefully looked and seen how governments in their own countries responded to these and the UAE came out right on top and because they are the millionaires and the senti millionaires the world is their playground they don't have to come to Dubai they could go to Singapore they could go to London they could go to Mumbai they could go to Sydney anywhere and having the opportunity and the financial ability to move to all these places why are all of them choosing Dubai they're choosing to come in here to start their businesses, have their kids go through education here, live the life of their future dreams in a city like Dubai. They are one of the strongest statements to the world as to why Dubai is the place to be. That's the first thing. Then you already mentioned it, the ease with which you can set up a business in Dubai, the transparency within the government, digitizing everything as a transaction. You don't even need to visit government offices anymore. The tax benefits, even if we do have marginal taxes in Dubai, we are nowhere close to being as expensive as any of the big cities in the world. The visas that have made it easy for people to come into the city. It is so easy to get a visa to come into the city today. The dropping of the value of property ownership for a 10 year visa to 2 million has attracted a large number of people into the city. Quality of education, healthcare, lifestyle, all these opportunities exist in this city. The economic uh, forecast of Dubai has been increased for 2023 while the world has decreased theirs. The real estate performance indexes globally, the price increase was dropped from 4.7% to 4%. Dubai was increased to 13.5%. But this is according to Knight Frank. So the indicators are all there to show why this is the place to be in the future. And the numbers are not going down. And for me, the strongest indicator when you get 117,000 millionaires investing 400 billion in just one year, they are the ones telling you that you have to be in Dubai. And we are expecting this year a 46% increase on that 117,000 millionaires. This is the place to be. But if you need to come in, you need to come in now. The, because we are pegged with the dollar, your investment value is protected. Because even with currencies devaluing and dropping in their countries, your money is losing in the bank. You're not making any mistake other than parking the money in the bank. Just because you put it in property in Dubai, even if the market is at a flat, 
your value of your currency is going up because back home it has dropped in its value. Also, when you look at what's happening right now, rents have been going up like crazy. Some place, sure on an average, enough. between 21 and 30 percent this year. In some places, it's gone up 70 to 80 percent. So, a lot of people who have been renting are now looking at buying into similar communities and lifestyles that they have. So, the opportunity is there for real estate in the primary as well as in the secondary. People are now looking to own their homes in Dubai. So. If you look at the global indexes, bubble indexes, the UBS index, Dubai is one of the only three cities out of the top 25 cities in the world that is in the green, that is in the undervalued. So we are, you have an opportunity to buy property in undervalued, not even fair and overpriced property. That's... As you heard that like Dubai doesn't need us to sell, Dubai sells itself. All what you need to do is just mention this amazing point that the doctor has mentioned. Thanks a lot for this episode. Thank you, doctor. And Thank see you. you in the next one.